Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to the Captain's Collective Podcast, brought to you by Skinny Water Culture, Hell's Bay Boatworks, and Orvis Fly Fishing. In today's episode, we sit down with John McClowski, who guides both in Alaska and North Georgia. John specializes in spay fishing and swinging streamers for monster fish. And in this podcast, we talk about John's introduction into fly fishing, how he has grown as a guide, what he has learned from teaching other guides, and how he got his face on Sweetwater's lager, Guide Beer. This episode is filled with great insights on attitude, reading others, and how to advance as an angler. We hope that you enjoy. This is the Captain's Collective. I don't say it's anything you choose. I think it picks you. You know, it's genetic. Let everything else stop in the world and just be quiet. And then it's amazing where your mind goes at that point um, and where it doesn't go. And sometimes just that quiet space is, is what we need, and especially in this day and age. You have a fly rod in your hand. It's this tool that takes you to beautiful places. You meet hopefully wonderful people. And it's just this cherry on top of this outdoor adventure. When the fish is coming, that shot within a shot, that timer starts. Beep, 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 No one else knew anything anyway, and you just might definitely make it enough fish to go along. But so what Grandpa and Dad would tell me is like, all right, where's the old big trout laying out there? Where's his shaving cream on the water? Where's he been shaving this morning? That's look for his shaving cream on the water, and that's where he's going to be. All right, John, thanks for... Uh making this work. It's been an interesting past couple weeks here. Yes, it is. I'm really glad that we could sit down in the middle of the corona outbreak. (laughs) Zombie apocalypse. And, uh, you know, we were, originally we had this great day plan of brown trout fishing and... uh, Yep, it was wonderful. And, uh, but I'm, I'm glad that we're here. Thanks for doing that. What I'd love to begin with on the podcast is just how you got into the outdoors and how you got into fishing. Um... Uh, I, I got into fly fishing when I was a young teenager, and it was uh, just a, one of my friends at church named Doug just talked me into doing it one time, and I found it was like, oh, okay, this is different. Than, you know, Georgia wasn't huge for fly fishing, so I started learning that, and then kind of went back and forth uh, through high school, and then, you know, a little stint in college, this and that, and then came back, and... <clears throat> Went to the fire service and was still, you know, still fishing here and there. And then my days off, I managed a fly shop and just kind of, it just fell on my lap um, about guiding. And then it just, dude, all my 20s and my 30s. Did you grow up near Atlanta? Yeah, yeah. We were, um, I was born at uh, the local hospital, uh, Kennestone Hospital. And uh, yeah, I spent most of my time. Went to one high school, didn't work out. Ended up at Etowah, and that's where I had a lot of friends there anyways. That's where I graduated. And definitely not a lot of high schoolers fishing at the time, you know, fly fishing. You know, fishing. Not, not, I don't really recall, not like we didn't have any clubs. You know, they have a bunch of clubs now and mm. stuff. And um, no, it really wasn't. And I think back, I don't think I knew too many people that did it at all. Uh, mm. You know, I was just like any teenager when it came back. And I, I, I traveled fighting all through my teens and... My twenties and stuff. So, <clears throat> like mixed martial arts. Um, it, uh, sh- well, technically it's Okinawa. Like Shorten Ru, Shorten Khan. I fought on uh, some Shotokan teams and some U.S. karate teams and stuff like that. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was cool. The first time did you go out? Did you fall in love with it, or did you? I don't really recall falling in love. I'm not really. Man, it's gonna be sad to say. I don't really f- usually. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, it was cool. Yeah, it was cool. It was just something. I, I like things that people don't do. Mm-hmm. I like to be, what do they say, the, uh, your own your own beat, march to your own beat. That's kind of like, I like to do my own thing. Yeah. And I like to do it my way. Well, a lot of people, when they first start fly fishing, it's a frustrating experience because there's so many Oh, sure. Factors oh, I can remember it. being frustrated. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and at the time, there really wasn't that many people to go to. I mean... Where would you go to learn? YouTube didn't exist. Internet didn't really exist. You yeah. know what I mean? That's a long time when, ago. When was it that you started when you were in high school? Was that in the... I, was, I think I was probably... 
You know, I'd already, you know, I fished when I was a kid. I mean, with like a spinning rod, but I think I picked up a fly rod for the first time when I was probably maybe maybe 14, okay. 15 maybe. And then throughout throughout high school and throughout college, you kind of dabble in and out. Yeah, and it, yeah I mean, sort of. Man, it's just, you know, when you're growing up, you got so much going on. You really don't know where you belong, you know. So I did it here and did it there. Um, when I got to the fire service, I, I met one dude that, had it in common and he kind of talked me back to doing it and then you know it's just like anything you know the passions don't not all passions work the same way you know yeah and i had a real passion for fighting i really enjoyed fighting so that's what we did so for you it's like you you start working at a fly shop mm-hmm. around atlanta and mm-hmm. then you start guiding locally i'm guessing or yeah you- yeah 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 for years i was with uh chris scally with river through atlanta and i still am with him but I've ever since expanded. But yeah, we do, I do that all, all summer, fall, winter, because it's a tailwater. The Chattahoochee is tailwater, so you can guide it pretty much all year, except it kind of the lake turns over. It. It's kind of crappy for a couple of weeks, but most of the year, mm-hmm. you know, you can just in, um, we <clears throat> we do jet boats, rafts, drift boats, wade, all that. Mm. And then eventually you worked your way into doing some time in Alaska. Could you tell me about that transition? Yeah, actually, that... this is pretty funny. Uh, I was doing an Orvis shoot, um, and there was another guy there that I, I'd known gone years in Alaska, and I just asked him, you know, dude, I need more money mm-hmm. during the w- summer. And so he just he, <clears throat> he put me in touch with the guy I still work with now, uh, Jim Johnson, and... He, he gave me a chance. I didn't have a captain's license at the time. So he said, just come up and, you know, you can try it. And he probably thought I was an idiot. But I guess I got there. He found out, oh, this guy's, you know, not a complete fool. And so he just kind of kept me on, got my captain's license, and here we are years later. How hard of a transition was that to make to go from, like, a kind of work in your home waters, for lack of a better phrase, to mm-hmm. trying to go over to a new fishery? And oh, sure. All that? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, when I get up to Alaska, um, I didn't really, I've never even seen a salmon in real life, really, you know, mm-hmm. um, had no clue how to fish for him. Um, and the dude that got me hooked up with this guy, Chad, he actually really was, you know, influential in, in showing me how to do things and his, you know, how he did it. Cause he had years of salmon. I mean, dude, I didn't even know how to kill a fish really just because we don't kill fish, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was, yeah, the, the, you just flopping around out there, just throwing it up on. <laughs> what was uh, no, that no, like I, yeah, I, you know, you figured out how to, you know, you pop them in the pop head, or, you know, you know, but it was just so foreign. I mean, it, you catch a giant fish and you hit it in the head. I'm like, dude, this does not. Seem I picture right. that being a moment though, like that happens to me sometimes in life where I'm in the middle of something new and I felt like I thought it through, and then now I'm holding this fish and I'm like thinking to myself, ah. No, yeah. I I should have asked this one. Yeah, yeah, did not see this one coming, and it didn't even cross cross my <laughs> mind. Uh, you know, yeah. it's like, and, it, and it's it was definitely a shock because people come up there just to kill fish. Mm-hmm. Everything that I grew up not doing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it was pretty funny. It, definitely, the first year was a super adjustment, and then kind of went from there. But yeah. It, and you were firefighting mm-hmm. that first part. How, how did you transition into the, this being your full-time focus? Yeah, so I guided for years uh, just on my off days and then um, just running a drift boat for Chris and stuff. And uh, I worked for a couple different fire departments and then um, just different things happened. I fell through a floor in a house fire and stuff like that. And so, you know, that that's pretty much how the transition went. I got... Got kind of hurt in there, and that was the last time. There was some other close calls, and it was, you know, I guess it was, it just kind of, it's hard to explain. It. Like, you know, people say things fall into your lap. This one just kind of grew out of nothing. Wow. It's really weird. I don't know. But you had had a couple close encounters. Oh, sure. At the fire department. Oh, yeah, too. man. Yeah, if you're in it long enough, you're going to have some, yeah, some close encounters, but. Yeah, no, I mean, I was young. I didn't care. I thought it was awesome. Mm-hmm. But the last one, kind of, that was a good one. So I feel like mostly I interview saltwater guys. I've had a few freshwater guys, Tom Rosenbauer and, and mm-hmm. um, Eugene Schuler from Fly Fishing the Smokies. 
And um, I feel like I have a good understanding of how saltwater guides structure their business as far as, you know, a lot of them are kind of a, a one man shop and some of them are on bigger teams. Um, but how do you kind of think through the business side as far as, you know, you say you, you work with different groups and could you explain some of that to me? Yeah, you, um, I'll try to break it down. Um, when you're working with a group, like this is a good example is um, the Alaska, you know, we have a whole lodge, you know, mm-hmm. you live with each other, you know, you share things to make each other stronger because if one person fails, you all fail. You all look like a bunch of losers. So it's a real open, you know, our policy is to, to, to make each other stronger. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to that, that's a good team thing. Um, is, and everybody's under the same lodge umbrella. Is that kind of how it works? Yeah. Or? Well, yeah. So we have a lodge, Cat My Trophy Lodge, and we also have a fishing camp, which is just a lodge, but it has, it's just set up different, and they're about 11 miles apart on the same river in the Nack Nack. So this year I'll be managing the camp, but the Cat My, the, the Cat My Trophy Lodge is like a real big log cabin, something you would picture to be in Alaska, mm-hmm. huge. It holds tons of families, you know, and we have a couple of cabins that it's wonderful, but it's, it's close. Mm-hmm. Now, if you go up to the camp, which comes right, we're, we're right below where the lake comes into the river. It's, it's open. The view is incredible. You can see if on a clear day, you can see way out, you know, all the mountains and all the, it's cool. And, um, it's a little walk to the to the lodge to eat and stuff, but everybody has their own cabins, kind of like you know little groups, two and four groups of in each cabin, and so it's just a different feel. Um, I I find that when of those two places, we're mm-hmm. all under the same umbrella, we're all one big team. Mm-hmm. So we'll do training sessions where we'll come up and each group, you know, we'll meet. Sometimes we'll just bring a bunch of boats and meet at a, at a short, you know, for working on swinging or, or techniques on different, you know, different water or, or, you know, different types of, if, you know, like if the glaciers, if the the wind blows and it blows the glacier water in, your techniques have to change a little bit. You know, we talk about that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of the clients, you believe it or not, we're not all fly fishing. I mean, they have, we have a lot of people that come in, you know, for spin fishing. Heck, we get a lot of people that never fished, which mm-hmm. blew, I was like, what are you doing up here? They just said, you know, <laughs> it's like anything, they just fell in there here in Alaska. I'm like, okay. So people sometimes, you know, cut their teeth on giant fish, and it's just mm-hmm. like, you're ruined. Yeah. Where, where are you going to go from here? Right? It's pretty funny. Um, but then when I come back here, you know, working as a team doesn't really it's kind of every man for himself somewhat and when i work for river through atlanta and like i said i still do but yeah you know, i you try to get that group together uh, but it's just it's not the same because you're not living together mm-hmm. and everybody kind of does their own thing and i do i kind of branched off and i do mostly spay because mm-hmm. really nobody else does it down here um and i find that that's it's a different way to present the fly it's a different the cultures, everything about it is different, and I like it. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of looking at a bobber, which is fine, you want a nymph, that's fine. But at some point in most careers, you you, you finally say, dude, there's got to be more to this. And this is just another way to, to produce, you know, a grab or a take or a good fight. And a lot mm-hmm. of times when you're swinging flies, you'll get the bigger fish because they're going after the streamers. Um, and so I, that appealed to me. Um, Alaska really opened the, the real door. You know, I was doing it before, but when I started Alaska, I was like, man, you know, this is the place to swing. Mm-hmm. So that, and working like as my, with myself and then working as a team and coming back, I just, I just saw the, the potential here with Trout Spay. Mm-hmm. And since I've pushed, you know, real pushed, really pushed, excuse me. Uh, companies that are just kind of taking an interest. Mm-hmm. Um, in like, spay fishing? Yeah, because, you know, spay's been around a long time. Um, but it, it, it evolves like anything. Mm-hmm. And we've really pushed for, you know, because when you first, you know, when you first think about spay, you think of like a 17 foot rod and these ridiculous giant 100 foot loop, you know, it's just, but it's not like that anymore. I mean, we shorten the rods, we shorten the heads. 
And you can still cast 100 feet. You know, who, who is going to be swinging 100 feet? That's, you know, but I'm saying you can still reach out with shorter rods. And that's mm-hmm. what's cool about what we do. And then I just kind of took that trout space stuff, shrunk it down, and just started, you know, trying it here mm-hmm. more and more and found out, okay, this is what I want to do. You know, so I still do bobber trips. Every every guide has to pay the bills, but I'd say probably 70, 80% of my year is spay. Mm-hmm. And for those who maybe don't know, can you describe what's Yeah, absolutely. Like? So, <clears throat> you know, regular fly line. It's integrated. You have a running line built into a head. doesn't matter if it's 45 feet or 37. You know, it's, a, it's integrated. Now, you can get spay lines like that. It has a running line and has an integrated head. But most of the time, you'll have running line like a mono, just a... 100 feet of mono wrapped on, you know, and then you have different heads. And they look they're, they look like fly line because that's what they are. But instead of being super long, they may be 20 foot or 18 foot or mm-hmm. 11 feet, you know, in some of these some of these shorter heads, 11 and a half feet, whatever. And there's a couple companies that really specialize in the shorter rods and the shorter heads. You know, OPSD, they're good people. They've taken care of me. They specialize in a single hand skagit and double hand skagit. So what that means is you can take a regular five weight mm-hmm. that you've just been used your whole life and you're like, well, it's been sitting in my closet because I'm tired of it. And you can set it up with this system, which is this mono running line. Or they have laser line, but any kind of mono running line, then you put a little loop on there and then you put your head on there. So now you have running line, you have a fly line, fly head, some kind of skagit head, and then you have a wallet full of sink tips from floating tips all the way down to, I mean, we have T20. And the, the, the ratio is just how fast it sinks. So the cool thing about this system is most of the casts are waterborne. So when you're going, there's, you know how you do a single hand rod, you, you back cast? Well, mm-hmm. we don't do that. So you could be up against... A, you know, a big cliff or trees, and most of our casts are in front of inside of us on our anchors. Instead of back casting, we come through the water and that, and we we create a, we call a D. The D loops come up, and that's what that's what loads our rod. Mm-hmm. So it's it's cool because it is fly fishing to a degree, but it's it's like a different world, different mm-hmm. language, and that's where I come in because there's so little inf- well this. That's not true. When I started, there was a lot of different information, but it didn't really help. And I had instructors, and they just they just didn't meet my mm-hmm. criteria. Well, I just didn't understand it. So I met a dude named Jeff Lesquet, and he kind of put some time into me and just tore down my cast and rebuilt it. And um, and then since then, I'm taking lessons from other people and kind of put everything together. And I, I mean, I've I've instructed something since I was a kid, mm-hmm. you know, taught karate, taught fire department, taught all this. I've always been teaching something. So this is just another thing. So once I kind of put it all together to where it made sense to me and I translated into teaching others, that's mm-hmm. where it kind of, all, you know, all came together because it's kind of, in my opinion, for me, it's kind of pointless for me to learn something and not share it. Mm-hmm. What's the point of that? I don't understand. So, in my opinion, if I can, if I if I have something, and I think it's worth showing, I'm going to show it. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna. I usually have, you know, I'm pretty passionate. So, if it's something that I like, and I can translate it to to teach you, mm-hmm. and I watch you successful at it, and you're like, oh my god, this is awesome, and you do it, mm-hmm. then you want to tell others, dude. That's just like our trigger pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> dude, those things are. You did a good job. Um, but we, uh, you know, one of the things too, I was interested in is if you had to bullet point the main, you know, what are the main advantages? Convince me, you know, I'm, I'm young, I'm in fly fishing. Mm -hmm. Convince me, convince me to learn spay. What are you going to tell me? Well, what I do is because I run across this all the time. What I do is if it's just somebody that comes to me and wants to learn spay that's different but somebody like you like you're saying that mm-hmm. comes to me and it's like oh i gotta let's do bobber fish i'm like cool so we'll bobber fish he'll catch some fish and then i said dude i got another way mm-hmm. new way it's you know it's it's you know it's, it's cool why don't you try it 
so usually I use if, if I'm trying to convince somebody, I try to find a time that is really like the spring will be excellent here for swinging. Mm-hmm. Instead of getting like one grab every now and again, you could get twenty or thirty a day. That's fun because you're getting instant feedback. So the best time to teach spay is when you're going to actually get that action. Um, and then so once I get them into that, then they really want to learn it. And then so I'll show them a cast. And then they'll figure it out. Dude, I cast further just now than I could with a, with a single hand rod. Yeah. And I'm, I'm against the boat. I'm not hitting anybody, you know. And so that's usually how it goes. I don't really have to convince. I just simply give you the tools, kind of show you a couple things to just kind of half ass it. And then mm-hmm. once, you, once you usually find out, once somebody bombs out a really nice cast, not even far, just clean. And it bangs on the back of the reel. That's I don't really have to do much, mm-hmm. uh, and that's different than, you know, you have somebody with a bobber. Yeah, it went down. Cool, you got a fish. But dude, there's something different when you're swinging a fly, and you you know fish are there, and you're just waiting. And once I get you where you don't set a hook, and you just kind of stand there, and they rip that thing rare. And, oh, dude, when they finally go for it, and you lift that rod, boom, that's. I don't have, you know, that's, I'd say out of all the fly fishing I've done, that's the only time I've not really had a, to uh, convince somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I do spay classes, the casting, I provide them all the gear, and that makes it easier because if they'll bring like a, a rod. Somebody told them how to set it up. And they come and it doesn't cast. I can't, it doesn't cast, it doesn't load. It's not in the window of that rod. Mm-hmm. So I, I have tons of books of, you know, just books and books of Skagit heads that I'll put on and, and they'll, they'll cast. But I, it's good for them to use a rod that's tuned and casting well. Because then once you even get half halfway into it, you're sending, you know, bombing 60-foot cast. And most of the time people can't even barely cast a single hand rod 60 feet, if you're mm-hmm. being honest. Mm-hmm. You know, 40 turns to 60 real fast when somebody's trying to... <laughs> But on a spay rod, you know, especially the shorter ones like OPST has and Echo has some small ones, and they still cast with effortlessly. I, it's awesome, dude. Mm-hmm. And it's it's it. And, and you think about situations, and you can think of times when you're like, man, I wish I could just get down a little deeper. God, or I wish I didn't have such heavy. You know, there's difference, but when you have a wallet full of tips, mm-hmm. I mean, this, you go to one and you're like, okay, this is, I know it's four foot deep and it's running fast. I need something a little heavier because mm-hmm. I see the, I know they're sitting there. So you switch tips, you score, you know. Mm-hmm. Then the next run, it's 10 foot deep and going slow. You're like, man, I, oh, I, need, I need something a little, and so you got the tip for it. Mm-hmm. And you just, you just go, you can just go from all of them. And you know what you learn. The more you learn, the more you realize there's more to learn. Mm-hmm. I like that. When you find you learn something and you're like, man, is this all there is to it? This mm-hmm. is not one of those things. The more you learn, you're like, dude, I need to learn more. Mm-hmm. That's Yeah, I, I heard an illustration one time of a seminary class that they said that they had the students come in and they said, like, let's pretend that everything that you could know is this whiteboard and then make a circle with about how much you know, you know? And then they did that at the end, and everybody's circle was smaller. Because as they learned, they realized... I thought you were going to say they would do a dot. Yeah. Well, yeah, at the end. <laughs> yeah. Because they realized, wow, sure. like when they came in, maybe they did a little, you know, but it all... They realized how much they still had left to learn. And it, to me, like, it's... I mean, that's the fun part about fly fishing. You get into it because you... It's fun to learn. It's fun to cast. It's fun to learn how to present the fly different ways. So, swinging, water depth. Where does dry fly, John... <laughs> So, your Instagram handle. So good. Where does where does that come in? Is yeah, my that, brother. Is there a funny story there? Or? I mean, I don't know how funny it would be. Uh, my brother. So I have a bad memory. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, I've been hitting the head a lot mm-hmm. with people trying to spay fish. Or? <laughs> yeah, that too, right? No, just through the years, you know. But I, I just don't remember a lot of things. So my brother, he set up a, I think it's an email account like twenty years ago. It was yeah. like Dry Fly John. Dry Fly John. Hot. Yeah, whatever it was. I don't know, Yahoo. Sure. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I remember that, and. I just I've just used it, just it for stuff. yeah. If you ever want to break into like things I have on the just 
very easy to figure out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, you know, and I always say, uh, well, the skate and the fly count, because we, we do a lot of mi- mouse fishing, mice and skate and flies in Alaska, and that's dry flies. Yeah, know. yeah, so. But I don't really do much it's dry n- fly fishing. It's not what I picture when I, I picture, Correct. you know, a parachute no one Adams does. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, with a big cowboy hat, you know, no, so, it's not me. So I know you teach a lot of classes in mm-hmm. you, one of the things I was interested in is what what are what do you think makes an effective teacher? Mm, that's a good question. Um, good teacher, that's a good one. Well, passion. You got to be passionate. If you, I'd say I have sat through classes all through my life that you know you got a boring guy teaching it. I I phase out. But if you have somebody that actually cares about it, that helps. I believe a teacher that is willing to learn, you know, like if you go in thinking you know everything, you're probably not going to learn much. But it's amazing how many times I've learned things through the years from the people I, I was teaching. And, you know, it's it's humbling because you realize you don't know that much. You may know more than most, but you don't know that much. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's always different approaches. So I think that going in knowing there's a possibility that I'm going to learn something, or it's a possibility I may look foolish. You know, it, it, I think somebody that comes in with a, you know, with with a clean attitude, that's a good teacher. Somebody that well prepared, that's an important one for me. If you come in and kind of wing it, that bothers me. Um, and I also found out through the years that it's okay for if you ask me a question and I'm teaching, and I don't know it, it's okay for me to say, you know what, I don't know. Let's find that out. Mm-hmm. That is important to me. Somebody that just makes stuff up. I'm, I've said this before to for people that you know doing class. I said, you know, that there's Google, you know, so if you just make it up, somebody can just Google it. Mm-hmm. And then they find out that you made it up, you know, you can probably lose some, you know, legitimate clients that you could have, you know, that kind of stuff. I think that you have passion, attitude, um, and, and pre- preparedness, you know, Mm-hmm. That's important to me. Mm, that's good. So I know that you fish in Alaska and you fish locally here mm-hmm. in kind of the, the Georgia area. Mm-hmm. And I know you fish wild fish mm-hmm. and then you fish also, you call them pellet heads. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> is that what, is that? The, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. It, as long as you can accept that. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk me through, like, I know there's a lot of people who would maybe argue we, we shouldn't mess around with any type of non wild species of fish talk, talk me through like what's the argument for allowing that to be or supporting that or well uh, in in my opinion um dude that's that's fine i mean if you, if you feel like you should not mess with anything wild fish well you can count out most places mm, most fisheries i mean somewhere hatchery fish have been put in mm-hmm. right um and there's an argument between wild and stream bread so you talk about, you know, stream bred fish that are still fed. Mm-hmm. I don't really consider that wild. Mm-hmm. Um, you asked specifically about the pellet head. Mm-hmm. So how that came about is I just I realized there's, there's money in it mm-hmm. and people have fun doing it. But you have to go in explaining it to people that even if they catch the fish of a lifetime, it's a big trout, you know, but... It's not that much of a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, so you just try to be a realist about it? I am. I try to be real about everything. I, I try not to... I try I try to just be straight. And that's kind of something I think I'm known for is brutally honest. Uh, not that I'm trying to be. I just am. Because mm-hmm. um, I appreciate the same for me. Um, but I'd say when it comes to the pellet fish... I started doing it because there's money in it, and especially when our lake, uh, the lake gets high, like right now. Mm-hmm. Right now, we're talking about go to the yeah, hoosh. We you gonna, can't. Yeah, we can't. You can't do it. Out. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's so high, and they're releasing so much. No. Now, if you're on the white, and they're, you know, they're blowing a bunch of water, it's fine. It's great. Not here. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? Do you go flip burgers? Or do you try to innovate? Or what? You, you, do you make something up to do something else to make money? Mm-hmm. So, um, the dude that helped me out with it to get up in the mountains, his name is James. He, 
I just came to him and said, hey, man, can you hook me up in the mountains? And, you know, they're a different breed. You know, they're, they they trust, you know, only certain people because they put a lot of money in these fish. That's, mm-hmm. that's a fact. Um, some of them are really old fish, you know, so they had to trust you. So once I f- figured out my game plan, I went up there and I started doing I sold it as like a training vessel for people coming to Alaska mm-hmm. and never caught a big fish. It's a good training area. It's, it's good training to, to, to see how they react to someone. You know, it's not like a wild steelhead or something, but they're they're bigger than the Chattahoochee fish on on you know on an average basis. So I started doing that, and then I realized people are interested in it as long as you're honest with them. So then I started. I stopped really nymphing it and stuff, and I started. I realized one day, just swinging, just one of my spay clients. I took home there, and it swung incredibly well, it, ridiculous. So I was like, oh, you know what? This is a good idea. And now I don't have the nymph anymore. So that's what, it's pretty much all we do now is just swing it. And, mm-hmm. you know, they may be pellet head fish, of course. You know, I'm not going to argue that. Uh, but they take a swung fly. Mm-hmm. And they're fun on a really uh, light trout spade. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's um, it's part of my classes. I'll do the classes, casting classes on the lake mm-hmm. or on the river. And then you go up to the small rivers with the, the pellet fish. And you don't really have to cast that far at all, but you get the understanding, you gain the knowledge to understand how not to set a hook, to let the fish take it and run, because they're still trout. So you learn these things, you learn how they react to the fly in different situations, and that actually teaches you for everywhere. So then you go to Alaska, and you've, you know, you train with me, so you're in Alaska, and instead of having three days of just botching these wild giants up, first day you know you may set one i'm like nope 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 and then you go back and you you let them take it and run and boom you -hmm. know first day you're holding giant fish up is you know you put your time in Mm -hmm. so that's how i sell i don't sell it as i don't even i don't even sell it as a trophy i don't call it trophy fish i don't i don't do any of that um not and this is so touchy I, i just you know some people never make it out of georgia so that's the biggest trout they're gonna catch I don't demean it. I don't make it. I don't even care. Mm-hmm. If you want to call it trophies, dude. I, it doesn't bother me. I don't care. I just know what they are. Okay. Mm-hmm. I know what it takes to make these fish. And I know they take a swung fly. Mm-hmm. So it's perfect. It makes for a lot of, lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just all perception. If you can take it what it is, go enjoy it. If you're going to have these fish and call them wild and giants... I'm not going to have anything to do with you because it's not true. Mm-hmm. So you were talking about using it as a teaching tool for your clients. What are some ways that you try to help your clients develop as anglers all mm. around? Yeah. Well, patience is big. No matter what kind of fishing you're doing. You'll have days where you catch you know, 20 or 30 fish, and some days you won't even see a fish. Um. I can tell you that I also do a little lodge. Excuse me, uh, do a little lodge in uh, Arkansas on the White with another buddy of mine, Austin, and um, that is that's trophy that's trophy brown trout fishing. It's streamer fishing mostly, and patience is. I mean, you could go, man, you could go an hour stripping stream, you know, big big giant streamers, and not see anything. But you know, eventually, when you put that three or four days into it. You know, you eventually at least get a shot at a big fish. And and that that is good. It's good to train people to be patient. Because if you're a numbers guy, you still count the trout that you're catching, you are not a streamer dude. You're a nymph guy because nymphs catch lots of fish. Some people stay nymphs their whole life. Some people stay nymphs because they don't know any better. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's tons of people that nymph fish that don't even know how to fish a streamer. And then when I show them, they're like, well, I'm never an infant again. But I think there's, I think it's stages. Uh, to get back to the question, I think there's stages in an angler, in an angler's life, you know, like a, you can put it in like a graph, you know, <laughs> year one to three numbers, you know, for a lot of people, maybe one to 10 numbers, mm-hmm. you know, somebody, I've met guys that are 60 and still count their numbers of fish. Just because it's not my way doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Mm-hmm. It's just exhausting. Um, but you had to step, you know, it's like tears. So as you go up, 
The next one's like, so you know, catch a big number of fish. Then the next one's maybe, maybe not so many fish, more quality over quantity, mm. right? Then at some point you kind of get better and you're like, dude, I want to catch, you know, the fish. I mean, you can do it on an infrared, but the chances are low. But when you open the doors into stripping streamers or swinging streamers, your numbers go way down, but your quality on the average goes up. You know, and, it, and like I said, it's possible to catch. We've caught giant browns on nymphs through the years. It's possible. But your chances go up for a big fish when you're fishing bigger flies. Now, you can fish, you can fish eight inch fly and take that percentage down to point oh 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 one, right? So every, I don't know, 15 hours, you may see a big fish sometimes. And then other times, you know, they may be turned on. But if you shrink that streamer down, you may get your numbers back. But the average may go way down, you know. It's just, you know, it's like it, it's just tears as to how from a beginning angling, you, you had to have steps. Mm-hmm. And some people don't ever make it past the first step because maybe they'll only fish twice a year. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're fishing twice a year, what do you want? I want fish, mm-hmm. right? Um, but, you know, like you're talking about the pellet head fish, the private water stuff, you know, they may just do that, mm-hmm. right? So wherever they go from there... You know, it's just not the same. So it really, I think, it's like anything. It's what you perceive. I don't perceive. It's like the views. Everybody's view is different. Mm-hmm. Their opinions are different. Just because I do things a really sweet way doesn't mean I don't think your bobber fishing is not cool. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's how people perceive streamer fishermen make fun of bobber fishermen, this and yada, yada, yada. I don't care about any of that. I just want to see people happy. So mm-hmm. when you talk about training anglers, I like to see them make a step up instead of fishing that bobber their whole life. Of course, that could be selfish because I get tired of watching bobbers. I can admit that. But, hmm. you know, when you put that streamer in your hand, no matter if you're stripping or swinging, it's going to up your chance to get a bigger fish for sure. Mm-hmm. And that's what I train, train clients. That's what I want. And when you train guides. hmm Talk to me about what you try to instill in them. What do you try to teach them? What are the primary focuses? That's tough. When you're teaching a guide class, there's so many egos. Um, you know, you'll have some that want to learn real bad, and others that come in that, that are convinced that they already have a grasp on it. But I'd say you'd be more successful as a guide if you can read people, you know, read situations. Uh, example... <laughs> You're talking to a guy, and you can tell he's irritated with you just talking to him because he wants some time alone. But you continue. That's going to lessen the experience for him. Hmm. And if you can't read that, you're just, you may not have another client. You know, he may tell his others, God damn, that dude, yeah. he does not <laughs> stop, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah but if you can read it, uh, even instructing, people only have capacity for so much. That's why I break down my my casting classes into sections because you can only the older you get your your mind's not a sponge right mm-hmm. so there's only so much you can take in so if you try to teach them too much at one time they may forget it all and get frustrated you have to read that and if you can't do that you probably shouldn't be a guide now there are plenty of guides that just squeak it out mm-hmm. you know but I think it's important that's what I tell you know. When I'm training guides, reading people, you know, basic knowledge, uh, read, 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 and, you know, implement things into your own way of doing it. Because it's, it's good to own your own way of guiding. Mm-hmm. It's important. If you mimic somebody else, there's nothing special. But if you can make it your own, that's kind of how you get up above others. Mm-hmm. And what do you mean by that? Just because... People um, have a unique experience with you. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, so, all right, let's say that. All right. So, you're guiding mm-hmm. the same day. So, we're guiding a group. Mm-hmm. And you've got two, and I got two. Mm-hmm. We're in the same group. As we're going on the water, you're, you're, you guide your way, and I guide my way. My way, you know, high energy, 
enjoying it, telling them what they're doing wrong so they're successful, not barking at them, but showing them to be more successful. And let's say the way you're doing it, you just kind of laid back, letting them mistake, do it. Um, you, uh, your rule may be only tell them twice. That's it. I've heard that before. Twice, that's it. And that's the way you're guiding. At the end of the day, they're probably going to enjoy the dude that's a little more energetic, has mm-hmm. more passion, acts like he cares, acts like he knew he wasn't hung over from the night before. You know, I mean, dude, to be successful, I think you have to relate. And if you just act like a stump on a log, that's probably the kind of people you're going to get. Mm-hmm. Maybe once. I can't imagine somebody wanting to keep fishing with somebody that's boring. I don't know. <clears throat> but I know that through the years, that's what I tell you know, guys I teach, you know, you don't have to be a crazy person, mm-hmm. but you have to show interest. You know, you don't have to be yelling and screaming and hitting people on the shoulder and, you know, yeah, F this, F, you know, you don't have to do that, but, you know, be engaged. You mm-hmm. have to engage. And there's so many guys that don't engage, mm-hmm. you know, cross their arms, you know, whatever. He's not listening. Um, and then, you know, when I tell guides to read people, I mean read them. Like, if you're teaching them a certain way and they're not picking up, you need to know another way to teach them. If talking sweet to them is not getting their attention, be a little more stern. Because some people, like like a lot of, like, men that are um, have big companies, you know, they're millionaires. Mm-hmm. They're not used to being talked to in an instruction manner. They're used to people saying, oh, yes, sir. Oh, absolutely. But... When I want somebody to do something and they're not listening, you know, I'll snap my feet. You know, look at me. We're going to, you know, either you're just going to put the rod down mm-hmm. or we're going to do something because I'm not going to, at the end of the day, have you say, I ain't catching any fish and blame it on me. Mm-hmm. You know, so sometimes you have to do that. Um, and and it's, it's reading the situation. I'm not going to do it to some timid kid, you know, mm-hmm. that wants to learn. But there are people that are very hard headed. And if you can't get through to them, you're going to have a long day. Mm. So it, when I say read people, I mean in and out. Try to figure out, you know, when they're speaking, listen. Don't be on your phone. Like simple things you'd think, oh, that's easy. Dude, eight hours in a boat gets old sometimes unless you can engage, unless you can listen. You know, that's what people appreciate, right? You know, on the average. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's, there's, dude, there's so much to it, you know. You could fill a chalkboard up and, and still not even touch it. I think you have to kind of be born into this some way. Mm-hmm. Maybe not the guy, but some something has to draw you. And it can't be money because there's no money in this, mm-hmm. you know, like crazy money. It has to, you have to have a, a drive for this. And just a lot of people that are guiding are not called to it. Mm. Tell me about life off the water. One of the things I love about this show is I get to hang out with people and get to know them. And maybe I've seen them on social media or seen mm-hmm. photos or heard stories. But, you know, when, you, when you're able to drive up and you're able to cook some bacon and pancakes <laughs> and hang out around a grill and, you know, oh. um, share a beer and, and just get to know somebody, mm-hmm. I find that it, it, it really is enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering, what does your life look like off the water? Are you Are you very similar or do you find it you know you're a little more laid back i mean what does it look like for dry fly john at home and you know you ask my wife that would probably get a better answer um that's a dangerous thing to do though with my (laughs) guest (laughs) that Uh, could be its own podcast i I could see that um dude i'd love to say i'm uh like the big lebowski you know off the water but i'm pretty intense i think i'm pretty intense anyways Mm -hmm. um i hang out my family a lot when I'm off the water, I don't party anymore. I don't go. I don't do anything really. If if I can get it, because the problem is, when you're gone out of essentially the country, you know, as long as I'm in Alaska, it's like, you know, when you get home, you only have a certain amount of time to be with the kids and the wife. I really want all of it. Um, I'd say that that's. Pretty much me just hanging out with my family. I don't I don't do a whole lot, dude. I guide so much that when I'm off I uh rather be with the family or hunting. 
mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say uh, if you had to pin me to the wall and, and put a put a label on me, I'd say I'm pretty intense all year. And one of the things that I know about you too is that you work a lot with your son, and mm-hmm. that's something that's special to me because I work a lot with my dad in mm-hmm. his business. Tell me about that relationship. What does that look like for you guys to do that together? Um, you know, when I first met him and his son, uh, his his uh, brother, Mike and Ethan, they were just little kids, and I was still with the fire service, and I met their uh, their mom, you know, at the fire station and stuff, and <clears throat> we got along really well. And when I found out she had kids, um, I didn't really like kids. Mm-hmm. You know, I just don't like kids. So it took me a while to, to get, I don't know if you call it, get warmed up to, I don't know yeah, what you call it. Get your it. mind wrapped around it. Yeah, like yeah. I went from a wild, crazy person to now I have these two little kids looking at me, you know, this is With weird, dude. Big eyes. Yeah, dude. Yeah, just staring at you. So I had to change a lot of my lifestyle just because if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do 100% or I'm not going to do it. So I just decided to change a lot of mm-hmm. stuff about what I do. So when he's growing up, they definitely saw, both of them saw, you know, I work hard. Um, and he really didn't show interest. Like, I put him through archery. I taught him, you know, I taught him how to shoot the bow, and I take him to shoots when they were kids, both of them. Mm-hmm. And the middle boy just, he has different interests. But uh, Micah, the oldest, the one you're talking about, he he would come out and he'd do the shoot, and then he'd put the bow down. And he's an excellent shot. He'd put the bow down for three months. Oh, it could irritate me because, you know I mean? My brother and I, and we try. I mean, we shoot two thousand arrows a week. I mean, we shooting all the time, mm. you know. And he just wouldn't do it. And then he pick it up three months later, be excellent, and then quit. And mm. it, oh man, I hated it. And I taught them both to tie when they were kids. They didn't care. And it wasn't until man, Mike was he's twenty one now. It wasn't probably six years ago he actually showed real interest. And then they came up to Alaska. And then he's just been coming up ever since, and um, probably about probably the same time, I guess he had an interest in photography. Mm-hmm. And my, my my wife was like, "Well, take him with you. He can do photography." So when I guided, he'd come do photography for a while, and he'd help me guide a little bit. And then as he went better, you know, more capable, mm-hmm. and he learned more. He kind of got his own clients, you know, and that's how that goes. So he goes to Alaska and stays with me. Then he comes back here and he guides with me here and does the photography the whole time. And he also train he does shoots with like Glock and stuff through um, a guy we um, a buddy of ours named Shane. Um, so he does photography while he's here also. That's um, awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean he's he's coming into his own. I don't know what he's going to do with it. You know, I told him college or military, and now he's a captain. So I don't know what happened. I <laughs> lost that battle. And of course we have dogs all over my house. I lost that battle too. So. <laughs> So, are you ready to do some rapid-fire questions? Hit me. This has been one of my most anticipated lists of rapid-fire questions. Hmm. Not to build too much anticipation around it. Yeah, I'll try not to get too excited. So, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start here. Who is your fly fishing hero? Jeff Gay. Can you explain who that is? Just oh, for those yeah. Who oh, maybe don't know. Oh, Sorry. I thought we were just doing rapid. Got it. So Jeff Gay is the dude I was telling you about that helped me with my cast. But he's not just a instructor. He's a, a wonderful person, and he is an excellent host. He comes up and brings groups up, and when he when he's talking, there could be forty people wanting his attention. When you're talking to him, he's you're the only one hmm. around. You're the only one he's talking to. It's amazing. It's weird. And I just, I just took who he is and how he acts, and I just was like, genuine. That's awesome. Yeah. So I know that you have a deer necklace. Mm. Could you tell us the story with that? Oh yeah, my daughter made that. Um, it was from years ago. It was one of my first. I, I we do a lot of bow hunting and stuff like that, and um, we shoot compound bows with, with nothing on. We shoot our fingers and no sights or anything, and we do like we do with long bows and. And so uh, it was one of my first ones I ever killed with a comp, you know, shooting the fingers and everything. Mm-hmm. It was a long shot. I was so proud of it. And I, th- and I walked up to it. I called my brother. I was like, dude, I just killed, like, the biggest doe ever. And I walk up, and this is all it had on his head. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't even have it on, do I? Uh, and it was, all, it was all I had yeah. on his head. So, <clears throat> And so fast forward 
to uh, five, five, five years ago, Scout. She's nine, now. so she's like four. She, we, I helped her make it, and she, she built the whole thing, and mm. it was like, just you know, you wear this, so you don't forget about me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. I love it. <laughs> yeah. If it's you a, weren't a guide, yeah, and you couldn't be a firefighter, yeah, what would you be? Vocationally, uh, not um, like existentially, but <laughs> vocationally. Mm. Uh, a hermit. <laughs> No, um, you'd be like see. one of those guys with like fifty cars in your yard. None of I them like work. it. None of them work. They're all on, yeah. on blocks. He yeah. doesn't even know what they are. Well, because I don't, I'm not a mechanic, so I could not work on those. That would that would actually that's actually really <laughs> accurate. I just throw them away. No, I think I would be a uh, some kind of pilot. Oh, okay. I'd like to fly helicopters. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, or a gunfighter. It's hard to say. Maybe both. <laughs> A helicopter guy that's using it. No, you know, somebody, you know, I interviewed I somebody I who uh, ran, Larry Hastings ran a charter fishing yacht mm-hmm. for a very wealthy family, and they traveled all around the world fishing and hunting. And on the podcast with him, he talked about how they would take a helicopter. Mm-hmm. And he said, they, when, when I interviewed him, he said that they had the only functioning helicopter. And I said, wait a minute, why do you need to say functioning? Because there was another yacht at the time that had a helicopter that did not work. It was just for looks. And I was like, man, you're almost there. I mean, why wouldn't... But anyway, long story short, they'd take strange. this helicopter yep. and they would go hunting out of the helicopter. Oh, man. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it sounded awesome. Back in like the 60s, 70s. Did he fly it or did he just... No, no. Oh. His, he ran the boat and the boat that had a helicopter and had boats and it was just... Just yeah. hearing the stories just blow your mind. Bush pilot. I wouldn't mind being a bush pilot. That'd be cool. I can see it. I don't know if they'd let you have the beard, but I can see it. So cool. I know that you um, you take your gear really serious mm-hmm. and you're really educated on, um, it's very obvious, just all the different uh, types of rods, reels, lines. Mm-hmm. Tell me, how do you think through trying to find good gear? Mm-hmm. Um, do you do a lot of testing? Do you buy yeah, a bunch of... I mean, yeah, what, so what, a lot of people send me stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I People ask me, what's your favorite rod? I'm like, the free ones? Mm-hmm. So that's like half true. It's kind of a joke, but mm-hmm. I really do like free rods. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say like spay rod wise, I've cast a lot of rods. Mm-hmm. And I, I try to find a rod that doesn't just work for me. I need something that's a good tempo for an all around client. Mm-hmm. I can tweak it sometimes by putting a lighter head or a heavier head on it to make it where it can cast. But I would say there's certain companies that meet criteria. Like I said, I broke down that class to where I can appreciate it and now I can show others and, and I get good feedback because of the gear I use. Mm-hmm. So I don't just take anybody's rod. I, I'll i take a rod either sent to me or whatever I buy or whatever and I, f- I put different heads on it. If I don't like the way it feels, I'm probably not going to use it. Mm-hmm. If I like that it can cast well, not for my tempo as much, but as... I know the tempo speed for most clients. Mm-hmm. For an average caster, they want to think they're lightning fast. They are not. So if I can get a, a rod that's somewhere in between, then I can tweak it, throw mm-hmm. in a couple, win, uh, like a 25-grain window lower or higher to mm-hmm. slow it down just a little bit. That's the kind of rod I'm going to do. And once I find them, I'm done. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, a, that's good. Um, what is the story? So... The way that I got connected with you is through just mutual friends at Guide Beer. Mm-hmm. And what's the story behind you getting connected at Guide Beer? And I have a poster in my garage that has, it's like an epic photo of you pulling a, a boat in a stream. Like, what's the story there? Like, how did all this... <laughs> is it my did, ass? That... Did you just... It is. <laughs> I saw that photo. I meant they get you to sign it. It's right on the waiter. Right on the waiter. No, um, awesome. but I... But, you know, what were you, were you just walking around big city Atlanta and they just said, now here's a guy that we want to put his butt on this poster. No, I mean, what's the story? I thought you were going to say, here's a guy that needs a shower. Job. <laughs> yeah, job. Exactly right. This poor guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Um, so for years um, with River Through Atlanta, we do a couple um, like corporate trips with mm-hmm. Sweetwater. And um, it was cool. We'd have like 10 or 12 boats out on the Chattahoochee. It was fun. And uh, I kind of got connected with their main marketing guy, and um, his name's Brian. And uh, 
we just started kind of hanging out a little bit. You know, I'd guide him, I'd fish him. And, and um, so one day before I went to Alaska, he said, he threw me this idea like three years ago, I think it was. I think it was four, three or four years ago. And I said, uh, he said, um, what do you think about the guide beer? And he didn't have a name for it. So he just called it guide beer. And the fact that when he told me 11% goes back to full-time guides, you know, mm-hmm. not, not guys that guide, you know, 10 or 12 days a year because they obviously have another job. But for guys that put their heart and soul into it and they dedicated their lives to this, mm-hmm. it goes back to people. Because a lot of times as guides, and you're not lucky enough to be married to, you know, a lawyer that has great insurance, you know, usually we're just all scrubs, you know, trout bums, and they like to call us. But, you know, to a certain extent, you're, you know, you're kind of bum. Mm-hmm. You don't have insurance, right, unless you come from lots of money. Um, you're barely squeaking out a living some years, right? Like this year. Look at this year. Mm-hmm. How, many, how many trips have we all lost so far because of this zombie apocalypse? So it really intrigued me when... when Brian told me about the fact that it, it goes back to our little community. And uh, I do have a passion, um, not really, ju- not just for catching fish. I have a passion to make our lives better, mm-hmm. not just guides, just period. You know, you want to see people flourish, and this is one way to do it. So when he said this, I said, I'm in. Yeah, count me in. So I signed a bunch of paperwork to keep my mouth shut, you know, which worked out well because I don't remember half the things anyway, so it was perfect. Mm-hmm. And then um, he messaged me or called the lodge when I was up in Alaska and said, hey, we got the first meeting. So I came home early from Alaska to meet, and there was other people in there, and, and, um, uh, and we all had this big meeting, and, you know, and it didn't. I liked where it was going, and then we did taste tests, you know, we put a lot of time into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it got real serious, and then they actually, the name was Guide Beer. I was like, that's perfect, dude. That's perfect, because it really wasn't, it's not, it's not technically, I mean, guides drink it, of course, because it's mm-hmm. our beer. But the, 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 you know, what we're helping guides out is that's part of it, but the Guide Beer was actually for clients. Mm-hmm. So they can drink a couple beers and not get completely shitty, mm-hmm. you know, and fall out of the boat. It's because that's why that's where everybody's like, why did they hire you know hire an alcohol content? Like, well, I mean, it wasn't really for y'all. It's not mm-hmm. for us. I mean, we enjoy drinking it, but it's really for guides with clients. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, it's, it's, the more we get it out, the more we get support, the more we have to give back. So it's a, it's a really important project, mm. but there's more history than just, I'm a guy that I drink it. There's way more history to it than that. There's, there's more into the whole, you know, the, the blood, sweat, and tears that came into it. And then we got, we got, we're still, you know, we still got stuff to do. It's not done. Um, and doing the cans is cool because keeping it fresh. Mm. Um, you got, you're one of the faces on it now. Yeah, isn't that weird? I mean, that's... Yeah, it was a shocker. Um, I thought Ladson and Tucker were messing with me, but no, they were. They put my face on a beer. And I was like, dude, that's it's every it's every uh, every young guy's dream. I never even think that anybody ever thought of it. Do you? Yeah. No, I've never seen a face on a beer can. Never crossed my mind. I thought it was like a the milk carton. Like, oh no, this Wheaties. guy's missing. <laughs> If you see this guy. No, no. Um, it's funny because I interviewed uh, Cleve Evans, who was the first guy to get the proceeds from that. And I interviewed him mm-hmm. in his house mm-hmm. after uh, the hurricane came yep. through and just wrecked the Forgotten Coast. And it, I mean, it really, one, it was really cool that they recognized the need from that hurricane because um, I'm in that area mm-hmm. and it, it didn't get as much attention as some of the other things that have happened over the years have. Sure. And it's, there's a reason it's called the forgotten coast and Cleve lives in that area. And I thought it was just really impactful to see something that, you know, in the outdoor community, if you can find good products that are going to give back to things you care about, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you do it? And it tastes, it tastes good. It's got a, it's, yeah, it's, good it's we were talking, I mean, it's light, but it's light in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause when you're yeah. on a boat or you're in the stream, you don't, you're not trying to, we're not sitting at a, restaurant or no. whatever 
you know, about to go no, to sleep. It's like, yeah, exactly right. It, and and that, that's what I try to explain to people. It's it's for the guides, for the clients. That's you know, it's mm-hmm. it, it's for everybody that it lives their life like this. But the the proceeds go back to mm-hmm. like Clive, the people that need it. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like this year we're going to be on a, on on a uh, a good track to. Uh, really be able to give back mm-hmm. to people that need it, which is awesome. I mean, it, it's. I mean, look at what's going on right now. Yeah, people are going to need it. There's going to be plenty. It's going to be a rough year. Plenty of people. Um, so another another thing you were talking about, you know, it's it's good for clients. You know, speaking of alcohol and clients and everything. How do you? What are some quick quick tips on helping a client through a bad day? Hmm. Or just helping it, any angler, just somebody you're fishing with somebody and they're having a rough day. How oh, do you sure. Try to keep things positive. Um, you gotta, you know, you gotta learn to laugh it off. Um, usually, if they lose a big fish, which it happens, I tell them, "Dude, I've lost so many fish of a lifetime. <laughs> it's mm. the way it goes." Um, you know, if you can, if they can take one or two things away a day, and they actually imply, uh, implemented it and used it, it's a successful day. Mm-hmm. Some days they pick up more. Some days I pick up less. Um, and like it's like anything, dude. You got to read the client. This goes back to this every time. Mm-hmm. If they're having a shitty day, and they don't open up, you better be able to watch and see. Okay, well, how can I how can I help? Because it's getting worse. And then you may see that they their cast is garbage, or they're setting the hook when they should just let it run, or they're breaking fish. Off. Why are they breaking fish off? You got to you have to be involved mm-hmm. because if, if you're a guide and you're not involved and you're not in it. You would not be able to help somebody the way they need help. Hmm. It doesn't matter. Hmm. So, you're pretty into barbecue, right? Sure. What, what's your favorite? Do you have any favorite barbecue recipes? Because I like smoke wings. So you know, I, I I told you earlier I partnered with Traeger for a little cooking segment mm-hmm. on the show because I found a lot of fishing guys are really into cooking. Yeah, man. And definitely really into eating. Talk me through what what's a what's some good dry fly John smoked wings. Like? Oh man! Um, so I soak them in uh, like Italian dressing or something mm. for like six hours or so, and then uh, with garlic and stuff like that, mm. and maybe a little Worcestershire sauce. Soak it in, you know, eighty, a hundred wings, and then put them all in the smoker. Oh, dude! And then at the end, my wife likes to take them out and then put them in the oven for like seven minutes, you know, and like broil. Mm. Oh my god, dude! I gotta eat some wings now. <laughs> We yeah, got so. we got the grill. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Just uh, six hours of waiting for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, that's... Oh, and deer. Man, we eat so much deer at the house. Back straps. You know, I mean everything, dude. I love it. So I ask a lot of people this question, and mm. I'm interested in yours because one, you're in the freshwater world, and most of my guests have been saltwater, mm-hmm. and two, because you travel a lot and you work with a lot of guides. Yeah. In your opinion, what makes a great guide? Hmm. It'd probably be the same thing as before. Somebody that's passionate about their art, knowledgeable, patient to a certain extent. You know, like I said, you gotta know when to turn on the heat and when to not hmm. be so forceful. Dude, there's a lot. I think it takes time. Hmm. Or you quit. You know? Yeah. I mean, you probably hear that story every time from good guides. Either they're gonna quit or they're gonna learn it right. You can't really teach, dude, you know you can't teach a lot of this stuff, you know. You can teach tactics, you can teach guides certain things, but you cannot teach them to read people very well. Mm-hmm. That's something you just do, in my opinion. Mm. And then my last question, and I like this one, um, if we could put up a billboard mm-hmm. and it could just say one thing to the world to see, what would you put on it? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know, dude. That's a good one. You got me. I don't know. If you had a a theme song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like every day, your day started with an old cheesy montage pre-television show theme song. What song would it be? Uh, Lone Ranger. (laughs) <laughs> I can see it. It fits. We need to make that. 
We need to get your son to make a video. That was an easier like a, question. Yeah, you were ready for that one. Yeah. Well, uh, hope. Be, How about hope on a billboard? Hope. Hmm. That'd be good. Done. So, uh, any any closing thoughts, or what's the best way for people to keep up with you and follow you? I probably probably Instagram Try mm-hmm. Fly John. Emails I answer them when I have to. My website's garbage, mm. even though the fact that my brother builds webs professional with wonderful websites, he just keeps telling me to do this and that, and I just keep forgetting. So mm. it's my fault. I'd say Instagram's the easiest way. Mm. Well, good. Thanks so much for giving me some time, and oh, I know we had to. We really had to scratch it out to make this work. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it, man. No, of course, and I appreciate you. Here we are. So, well, thanks, John. Oh, thank you, man. Thanks again for listening to the Captain's Collective podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, and let's face it, if you've got this far, you probably do, or you're busy doing something else, we would love for you to share it and take some time to rate us on iTunes. We appreciate your support. Thanks again for listening. This is the Captain's Collective.